everyone. My name is Chris Glover, and I'm the member of Provincial Parliament for Spadina, Fort York. And this is our anti-racism town hall. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we've got four panelists with us this evening. Uh, we've got Laura May Lindo, who is the MPP for, uh, uh, for Kitchener Center. And she's also the anti-racism uh, critic for the NDP. Uh, we've got Amin Ali, who's a former TDSB student trustee. Uh, Sean Conway from the Curve Lake First Nation. He's a counselor there and uh, the Indigenous Peoples uh, Committee Chair. And we've got Danielle Morrison from a uh, member, who she's a member of the Anishinaabek of the uh, Nongashing. Uh, and she's coming in, she's a lawyer as well, and she's coming in from uh, Winnipeg. So thank you all to the panelists for joining us. Uh, we were supposed to have another panelist, Zanena Conde. Uh, Zanena is an incredible activist and I've known her for oh, 20 plus years. As she's in her 80s, I was talking to her this afternoon, she was gardening and a half an hour before the meeting started, we got a call that she'd fell, uh, she's broken her foot, she's on the way to the hospital. Uh, she said though that she would try to zoom in from the hospital and we said, no, don't do that. <laughs> but I think it speaks to her spirit that she still wanted to participate. She's been an activist for her entire life. She was the first uh, black woman who was a minister in, a, in, a, in the Ontario government. She was the minister of education uh, in the Ray government, the NDP government in the early 1990s. Uh, so it's, it's unfortunate we won't have her, but we've got an incredible uh, range of panelists here. I'd like to start the meeting with uh, the uh, land acknowledgement. And we acknowledge that, our, that this uh, meeting is taking place on the traditional land of the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabek, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And I th what we're gonna do is we're just going to give each of us, our, our panelists, an opportunity to introduce themselves, to talk about uh, what work they've been doing and to talk about this moment in history. Uh, there is a, it, there's an increased uh, awareness of, of racism and of systemic racism. And, and this growing awareness is leading to an opportunity. And the purpose of this meeting is to actually develop an action plan for systemic change. And so the overarching question that I've asked the panelists to think about as we're, as we're having this discussion is to think about what actions can we as individuals and what actions uh, can we as a group or as a community take to seize this opportunity to bring an end to systemic racism in our society. And so we'll start with introductions. Laura May, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me. Um, I am actually calling in from Kitchener. My riding is Kitchener Center. So this is land that has been uh, held down, uh, loved, stewarded, cared for by the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the neutral people. Um, and prior to being elected, I was the Director of Diversity and Equity at Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, worked rather closely with the Senior Advisor of Indigenous Initiatives there, and she had taught me that um, the land acknowledgement is just the, the first step, that part of what I'm supposed to do when I acknowledge the land is make a connection to the conversation that we're about to have. Um, and so as Chris has directed us to think about the change that we want to see, um, and I think about the, the land that I'm on, and to be honest, uh, not too far from my house, there's a land back action that's taking place where Indigenous, urban Indigenous folks here, um, primarily, if not like 90%, if not more, um, of this group are Two-Spirit Indigenous people. Um, have literally taken back Victoria Park. Uh, it is the major park in my riding. They are um, teaching, learning from each other. They are focused on building community here, whether or not uh, the system around them is going to provide them with what they have asked for for far too long. They're asking for land that was theirs in the first place, which is the interesting nature of racism that we are often positioned um, to ask for things that, our, that are actually ours, um, to be treated with respect that we should all be treated with, um, and to challenge systems that are supposed to keep us all safe when they are not keeping 
uh, so many of us uh, safe. And so with that as my sort of backdrop, um, I am the MPP for Kitchener Centre, I am the critic for anti-racism as well as citizenship and immigration, and I'm also the chair of the Ontario NDP's uh, Black Caucus, which is the first Black Caucus in uh, Ontario. Um, it is literally the first time in Ontario's history that enough Black people have been elected in a single party, so we formed a caucus. Um, we've been focusing on uh, anti-Black racism and ways in which uh, community have been left behind uh, in a lot of legislation uh, that's passing. Um, it has been wild to watch solidarity rallies happening all over this province and all over the country and across the globe. But I'm, I'm not going to talk about the globe. I'm just going to talk about this country because we spend far too much time pretending that racism doesn't happen here that we didn't steal land, that we don't participate in genocide and colonization. Um, and it is part of my job and my mission in this life uh, to make sure that I speak truth to power while I'm in this position of influence. Um, and I'm excited for this conversation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Laura May. It's, it's always wonderful. Laura May in the legislature is one of my colleagues and she just has this incredibly calm demeanor and just cuts the government's statements to pieces without ever losing her calm. It's the most amazing thing to watch. If you, you know, I, I, I know the legislative channel isn't that exciting, but if Laura May's up, be sure to tune in. Okay, uh, Sean Conway. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Anim Bojo, everybody. Uh, Sean Conway Deshnikaj, Mishi Sagi, and Dao. Um, uh, thanks so much, Chris, for extending the invitation to myself to uh, come and sit on this panel. I'm excited to hear um, kind of what the community wants to hear and and respond in in our ways. And you know, I think it's a really good idea. Bit about myself. Uh, I'm a counselor here in beautiful downtown Curb Lake First Nation, which is in the Peterborough Kawartha riding. Um, I've been a counselor here for about a year and a half now. Um, and we're just sort of sinking our teeth into, um, into the community and some of the big policy questions that, that have been going around in my mind uh, for many years. Uh, I was sort of first radicalized uh, during Idle No More a uh, number of years back and, uh, and have sort of taken a, a, a big look at about the history of Indigenous people and my community in our relationship with Canada, with Ontario, and, um, and how we can make our communities uh, vibrant and, uh, and, and thrive in in the 21st century, how we can um, acknowledge our history, how we can take community power and and build something really, really beautiful, despite a lot of the inequities that we face in, in healthcare, in infrastructure, in um, access to transportation. I live in the rural part of our riding and, and it's been many years just to get uh, some aspects of public transportation happening out here. There's some still a lot of work to do, but uh, I, I couldn't be happier with with where I've ended up and and giving back to community is is the best thing you can do. And I'm sure that you and Laura May and Amin and Danielle know that that's the most rewarding work we can do. Um, and, and also, I was a candidate for the Ontario NDP in the 2018 election, uh, which was a really wonderful experience uh, and really opened my eyes to a lot of the bigger picture um, systemic injustices that, that we have to combat and tackle together. And it's, again, a great testament to, uh, to you, Chris, in, in putting this panel together. And, you know, the first step, you know, going back to land acknowledgements is, is acknowledging that there's there's a conversation that needs to be happened. So this is a great first step. And if the first step is to make a, an action list, then that's all the better. So looking forward to the evening. Thanks.
Sorry, I lost my screen there for a second. Okay, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for being here. Uh, Amin Ali is a former student trustee with the Toronto District School Board. He's now a post-secondary student. And he and I go back about three or four years uh, when we were both sitting on the, on the school board in Toronto. So uh, Amin, would you please uh, do a bit of an introduction for yourself? Uh, no problem, Chris. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thanks so much, Chris, for hosting us and inviting us. I'm Amin Ali. I was a former student trustee for the TDSB for around two years. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, representing the students on Toronto Public Schools on the Board of Trustees, um, where I advocated against education cuts, supporting Black Student Achievement, getting involved with the Black Student Achievement Advisory Committee, and working on the board, helping to contribute to the board's new multi-year strategic plan, which has a lot of really bold equity initiatives um, in it. And for a year, I served as policy officer at the Ontario Student Trustees Association, which represents all 2 million students across Ontario's English, public and Catholic schools. And we did a lot of exciting work there. Um, I led the association in doing our first ever pre-budget submission in 2019, which recommended a major boost to the part of the, of the education funding formula that supports equity initiatives in schools. Um, and I also worked on the association's first ever multi-year strategic plan, the Students' Vision for Education, which had 35 recommendations in six areas, one of which was enhancing equity, in which we committed to a review of streaming, uh, specifically towards de-streaming uh, of schools, um, looking at mandating student well-being and identity collection um, across, the system, uh, across the province like the TDSB does, and, and pushing the government to implement true progressive modern sex ed, as well as looking at uh, implementing the true education mandate at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, since then, I've now student at the University of Toronto, pub studying public policy and city studies, and I joined People for Education this summer working as a researcher there as well. And I also worked last summer in MPP Mark Stiles' office doing uh, research and constituency work. And I'm just really glad to be here. I think there's a lot to be talked about. I think this year is, I would have never imagined <laughs> coming on a panel talking about a historic uprising and anti-Black racism in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, here we are. It's been a very, very interesting year. And I think there's a lot of real opportunities like the status quo that looks six months ago, I would have never expected any government, especially this government to commit to de-streaming, but the status quo is crumbling all around us. And so we have a real opportunity to shape systems and work in a new way to build systems to finally work for Black people and other Indigenous and people of colour in this province. And so I'm just really excited for the conversations ahead and see how we can kind of chart a course forward that actually puts Black people, Indigenous people and other people of colour at the centre of policy making in Ontario. Okay, I mean, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. It's uh, wonderful. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Danielle, would you please introduce yourself? Bonjour everyone. You want to see condition to cause the main dot dem national bag and gushing and dunchi. My name is Danielle Morrison. I'm originally from Kenora, Ontario. I'm currently living in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Treaty One Territory, which is the uh, homeland of the Ojibwe, uh, Métis, Ojibwe, Dene, uh, and I think that's all of them. Um, my work started in Friendship Centers. I'm a proud member of the Friendship Center movement. I started working at Friendship Centers when I was 14 and my parents met through Friendship Centers. And so a lot of my work actually stems just by being the child of a radical movement. And I can remember the first time I actually stood up for myself was by not saying the Our Father's Prayer in my grade seven class and I got sent to the principal's office. And when I went home, <laughs> my parents said, well, why don't you write a letter to the teacher about how it made you feel and I did that and it was a really great um, learning opportunity for both of us about how Indigenous people are constantly being singled out in classrooms like this. I was only 12 years old um, and since then I have moved to Ottawa. I did my undergrad in visual arts and Indigenous studies. I worked at the National Association of Friendship Centers um, for a number of years as a program officer and then eventually I started working with the independent assessment process as a application assistant for residential school survivors that were going through their abuse claims. That led to a position with the Assembly of First Nations where I did some policy work and then eventually I found myself living in Winnipeg. I applied to law school in 2016 when I had a very young daughter at the time. She was only uh, almost two years old when I thought about applying. I honestly didn't think that I was smart enough to get into law school and under the encouragement of a lot of my friends and my family, I took the plunge and I was accepted unconditionally in 2016. And since then I graduated in 2019 
Um, law school led to a lot of great opportunities for me to get involved with student-led movements, uh, such as the Student Pipeline Action Committee, in which we fundraised over $10,000 over the course of about a year and a half that went towards frontline movements, uh, such as the Standing Rock Legal Collective, and also supporting um, action on the Line 3 uh, pipeline going through Manitoba. I sit on the Indigenous Advisory Committee with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. I went on the national tour with them when they did Going Home Star. And so we've done a lot of work on that. And I just got my call on Monday uh, this week. So I'm a brand new lawyer and I'm really excited about what that work is gonna entail. Thank you so much. Um, really what I see my role is, is as an advocate and a voice for change and what can I do to empower others and empower my community and just disrupt the system. It's always been about disrupting and dismantling the system that oppresses us because these systems weren't built to support us. And I had to learn that the hard way through law school by being one of the very, very few indigenous people that are trying to learn through this very Western oppressive uh, colonial lens. So the fact that we survived law school in and of itself was a huge success. And I'm just really, really proud to be here. And I'm a super proud member of Nangoshing. Uh, great attempt, Chris, on the pronunciation. We'll work on that. Um, and I'm also a proud mother, like I said. So I'm really, really happy to be here. Well, thank you so much for being here, Danielle. Congratulations on being accepted to the bar. And uh, it's, it's great. You know, and I, I think it's really wonderful that you are now part of the bar because it's a position of, of influence where you can actually use, bring your voice and we need more Indigenous voices. Um, to the audience, to people who are just tuning in, this is an anti-racism town hall, and we are joined by panelists Laura May Lindo, MPP Laura May Lindo, Sean Conway, uh, Amin Ali, and Danielle Morrison. And if you have a question on your screen, you'll see a text box. You can just type your question in there. And we are already getting questions from the audience. So we're gonna plunge right in here. And the first question is, what is your opinion of replacing the Police Services Board and the SIU with a popularly elected civilian review board with guaranteed representation of racialized people, Indigenous people, LGBTQA plus people, workers, and women? Um, so, who wants to tackle that question? I, I'll start. Okay. Um, I think it's a, I think it's an absolutely wonderful idea and I think we can tie it into some of the work that, um, uh, that Chris and, and Laura May have been doing with the End Police Violence Policy Paper um, as, as it in cap, encompasses a lot of those suggestions in, um, in allowing democratic representation in our police services boards. I think that if our communities um, are empowered to see themselves represented democratically. Um, I think that that adds a level of of, um, of oversight. You know, it's not it's not quite a, it's just again a first step into into more more equitable policing services. But you know, democratically elected police service boards um, with representation of what the community actually looks like is is really important and a great first step. You know, in British Columbia, they elect uh, you know the uh, Parks and Rec uh, folks at the municipal level. You know, it's not a big stretch for that to happen in Ontario, and I think it's a great first step. Thank you, Laura May. Uh, thanks, Chris, and I'm in full agreement with Sean. Um, just uh, on Sunday, actually, in my riding, there was a Black Somali man um, who was arrested. Um, he had originally been given a dangerous driving charge, and then he has mental health issues. He drove away. Long story short, um, caught on tape, there were about 10 to 12 officers surrounding him. Uh, they took him down. They hit him. It was caught on tape by a couple people. Um, I'm telling you this not to um, relive the trauma of it, but to explain that part of what the SIU 
the calls for independent investigations are meant to do from the community standpoint is kind of cathartic. It's, it's the moment where community members can explain what systemic violence actually looks like and acknowledge that. And the system that we have in place is more about justifying why systemic racism happens in policing. And I think that that's the biggest tension. Um, the more I've been speaking to community about that particular instance in my own writing, um, and the more I connect it to the conversations that are happening around um, you know, the over surveillance of black, brown and indigenous bodies, um, the violence that we're met with when we do something that if it was a white person who had made the same mistake, they would not be met with the same level of violence. Um, I realize that what, when community calls for independence uh, to, to look at instances like that, they're asking for somebody to say, do you see the violence that we saw? They're not asking for a justification for it, or um, they don't want you to acknowledge that there's some kind of weird rationale in the system. They want you to talk about the impact. And I think that community will do that for community. Um, and then that will lead the change within the systems that are hurting us. So I'm all for, um, for making that switch and continuing to fight for uh, community representation in, in oversight bodies. Thanks. Go to the, the next question. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's see. So the next question is, and, and this actually goes back to a discussion that we were starting before this, we actually went live on this call. It's about economics. So more than, and this, this is the overarching question that I have is, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about the police, but to what degree is systemic racism about economics? And here's a question from the audience. Uh, this person's asking more than 50% uh, of youth in indigenous communities are below the poverty line. Uh, one third of inmates in provincial federal jails are of indigenous are in, from the indigenous community. Uh, what measures are taken or can be taken to address uh, the, such a situation? And just switch back to my screen, Danielle. Hi. So I live in a province where we're really lacking on justice programs such as uh, Gladue writers which would have a significant impact on the number of Indigenous people that are incarcerated. Um, when you look at some place like Ontario, which has a publicly funded GLADU program where you have GLADU writers available to Indigenous uh, offenders, there's a significant alternative that's available beyond incarceration. You have to work with communities to look at what alternatives to jail time are available and ensure that that person who has fallen off the path is given an opportunity to, um, I guess, make amends with victims to rehabilitate themselves. Because really what happens is when people are sent into jail, when they're put back out on their way, they haven't actually received the help or the healing or the assistance that they need. And so they're, they're more likely to reoffend. Um, and those numbers are, probably quite high due to places like Winnipeg, where you have a number of Indigenous people that are in the penitentiary or in the remand centre. Um, and I mean, when it comes to young people, there's just not enough lobbying behind programming in general. People believe more in punishment and deterrence than they do into rehabilitating and treating the really root uh, causes of these problems, such as uh, poverty, lack of housing, lack of health care, social services. I mean, like the list goes on. Um, one of the really innovative ideas that I've seen happening in Kenora, for example, is a community justice center, uh, which has been a partnership between uh, the Ministry of Attorney General, uh, all the healthcare workers, social services. And so that when somebody comes into the system, they are looked at as a person from a holistic approach. And what does that person need in order to survive the system? And this is actually based on a model that was developed out of Brooklyn, New York uh, at the Red Hook Center in which they were looking at how do we uh, decrease these numbers? Why are people reoffending? And so that's one way of uh, looking at it is how do we look at person, 
entering the system holistically and then also making sure that the province funds it because there's just not enough funding people are more concerned about putting money towards jails which actually costs more money than it would to actually treat that person and get them back onto the right path thank you much uh i saw sean and then laura may sean go ahead yeah i think i think danielle really really knocked it out of the park there and it does stem back to the way that we fund communities from the Ontario level, but also through the federal government. Uh, and, you know, we look at um, some of the First Nations health centers and, and also the, the, the friendship centers and a lot of the preventative work. Um, that's, that's really where we should be focusing a lot of efforts um, in providing programming for youth and for uh, individuals who are experiencing poverty or who are falling through the cracks in, in one way or the other in being able to uh, reach out to uh, those individuals and give them the supports that they need to thrive I think is the is the way to do that and we see that even in in some of the communities in my area um, we're constantly playing catch up with the bigger cities and towns and access to resources into qualified individuals who can provide services and uh, support our community members in accessing the education to give back. Um, so it's going back to the whole, the social determinants of health in, in you know, how everything intersects and how everything is connected. And, um, and it's gotta be a holistic approach in, in combating those issues like Indigenous incarceration and that 50% of Indigenous children are living in poverty, which is abysmal. And there's there are simple solutions to simple problems, but there are complex uh, ways to get about to simple solutions. It, you know, we can say we need more funding, but we need to know what that means and we need to targeted into those restorative programs into, like Danielle said, the GLADU, the GLADU writers are, it's an amazing program. Jordan's principle is amazing. And, you know, it's just been a, a total battle for years to, to fight for those things that, that, you know, that a lot of people don't have to fight for. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it can be discerning, but you know, if we keep fighting, that's, that's the goal. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Laura May. Thanks, Chris. And I'll be really quick. I actually think systemic racism is fully rooted in economics. Like the history is slavery. And that was a whole institution that used our bodies to build e um, economic strength and power in some communities and not others. And we are still living with the impact of that reality on this land. Um, and I think that because if, if that is in fact the root um, of systemic racism, if it's tied to economics that way, then the solution also has to be tied to economics, which is why there's a call right now for investment. Um, investment in community for things that have been so long underinvested, underfunded, um, not supported in the ways that we need. Um, and when, when money has gone into some of those, uh, those sectors like healthcare, education, um, housing, um, employment, it's left us behind because there's something inside like the, the mind of the system because it was built to not see us as people to not value what we need. Um, and so I think that's part of it. And I would also just add that the, the notion of restorative justice and, and investing in that is also how I would see like reparations for a system that has not seen us as human. Um, if you, you can't just sort of move to a place where now we're all gonna say that we all are valued in the same way when some of us historically have never been seen as people and never been given the same level of opportunity. And so I think that it's really important for us to understand that the notion of investing in community and investing in black, brown and indigenous people is a way of actually moving us to um, make amends for a history that we've, uh, far, we've long forgotten. Thank you so much. Um...
we've got a follow-up question, but I just want to, for people just tuning in, uh, this is our anti-racism town hall. We're joined by MPP Laura May Lindo, Sean Conway of the uh, Curve Lake First Nation, uh, Danielle Morg Morrison from the Anishinaabek of the Noun Gashing. I probably didn't, I didn't do that well, okay. And Amina Lee, uh, who's a student at the University of Toronto and a important former uh, TDSB student trustee. So there's a follow-up question, uh, Sean, and it's for you, uh, but anybody can respond to this. So Sean, you mentioned inequality in the healthcare system. What's your p opinion of the healthcare system today and where do you see the biggest gap and opportunity? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest gaps that, that I've seen is the difference between on-reserve healthcare and off-reserve healthcare and the ability for communities to have control over the healthcare that, that happens in the community. Um, where, where I live right now, we have, a, um, we have a health center which is focused on a lot of preventative side. We also maintain a clinic by an area doctor who does a great job with our, our community. Um, but that's not the case in a lot of communities. And being able to open up uh, the ability for communities to um, have access to clinical services in, in communities, specifically in uh, more remote places where you don't have a couple of hours in a plane to go and see a doctor, um, you know, that's, that's definitely one of the, one of the first uh, steps. Is, is empowering uh, the communities to find and provide clinical services to other uh, community members. And, um, and, and that way, when the, the services are provided in the community, there are agreements and there are standards of care. And, um, you know, it's just, it becomes a, a part of a thriving community. You know, the, every community should have access to doctors. That's, that's it. Thank you so much. Does anybody, yeah, I mean. I think the biggest gap in the healthcare system from an equity standpoint is the fact that we have a healthcare system that, aside from not even being built to serve non-white bodies, does not have, I think, a lot of racial, have specifically black staff, black and indigenous staff who can care for, who understand the medical needs of black and indigenous peoples, can diagnose them and can, and can support them in, in a culturally responsive or at least sensitive way. Because when you don't have that, you see situations like I saw on Twitter, an Indigenous friend who works in the city of Toronto, whenever she, uh, she, she tweeted, whenever um, doctors realize she's Indigenous, they sometimes uh, note that they're surprised there's no blood, there's no alcohol in her bloodstream. And in BC, there's a gut-wrenching situation that came out a couple weeks ago that the, that the government over there is investigating, where healthcare workers, they're launching bets on whether Indigenous patients that come in, whether there's going to be alcohol in their blood, bloodstream or not when you have systems that are not built for people without real accountability and don't reflect the populations they serve, you see issues like this. Um, and it's a real problem and, it's, and, and I think, and I think it's, it's part of the contributive of, of, the, of, at least in the US, but also here in Canada, um, why you see black indigenous racialized bodies uh, really, I guess, succumbing more to COVID than, um, than their white counterparts. And I think in another respect, in terms of the biggest opportunity we have is that with the big, big overhaul that the Tories have made to the healthcare system, they've been negative in almost every respect. But I think the opportunity is that the system is in a bit of a state of flux. And so I think there's more of a willingness to consider change that there might've been five years ago. And so if we can get into office in 2022, there could be a real opportunity to take those changes, turn them on their head and take this big, massive super agency, which suddenly centralized all of healthcare and instead of using that centralized authority to guide public health care, use it to reinvest, use it to make those systemic changes to medical school curriculum, um, to, to the amount of racialized doctors that are in the system, to the amount of culturally responsive healthcare programs there are. The fact that all this change is happening, while it's bad, I think can be weaponized for a force of transformative good if we get into office in 2022. Okay. So there's a, there's a question here about healthcare cuts and there's a, a question that I, we had a discussion. I wanna just follow up on that. Uh, Zanina Akande, I had a conversation with her about 15 years ago when I was doing research on the impact of student debt in Ontario. And she said to me that, you know, Ontario's tuition fees, which are the highest in the country, our student debt levels are, are uh, examples of systemic racism. 
are the health care cuts that the government is making, are those also examples of systemic racism? And should we label them as such? Anybody want to? Laura May. My answer is yes. Um, the, when, when you think about systemic racism, um, I want folks to think about who is impacted by the changes, by the cuts, and what that impact is. Does that impact help their, them and their communities to thrive, or does it make their life harder? And um, I would argue that the healthcare cuts have made the life of Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks harder. I would argue that the rising costs of getting into university at a time where without a bachelor's, you can't get a job. Like when I was younger, um, you could get a job with a high school diploma. You could get a job before you were done high school. But nowadays, you have to have a bare minimum your, your bachelor's. And if you don't have, if you cannot afford to get into a bachelor's program, and there are a high number of um, educated uh, newcomers, for instance, that are here whose kids are not able to get into a bachelor's program because they cannot afford it, and then the government decided to cut um, instead of invest in education, that is a racist act because it actually impacts particular races um, more than others, and so I think. The only way that we can actually start to um, shift and make actual change to address racism is to call the things that are happening racist acts. It's not about the people. It's about understanding how the system is impacting certain people. With this pandemic, when the very first um, bit of information about how to stay safe was wash your hands regularly, and we have indigenous communities that our colleague Saul Memaqua at Queen's Park has been saying they are on boiled water advisory for over 20 years. How are they supposed to do that? That was the sign, the big, huge red flag that there is racism in the system. Did they choose to do anything about it? No, then they are carrying on a racist act. Can they change it today? Yes, will they? Left to be seen, muting now. Thank you. No, thank you for that response, Laura May. Uh, Danielle. I just wanted to add a quick note because I feel that there's a lot of misunderstanding about Indigenous students attending post-secondary education, which is that all of our costs are covered and that is a myth. Um, reserves get a limited and finite amount of funding to carry out basically all of the duties of running a municipality and that means that funds are spread very very thin between education and healthcare and running an entire community we don't get funding from provinces i was never able to qualify for a student loan because the assumption was made that i would get covered by my band and i was non-status at the time so this is a conversation that needs to happen along with dismantling and encouraging um, post-secondary education to keep those costs lower because while the costs are going up exponentially it's not like reserves are getting more funding to send their their students off to school um, there's huge waiting lists and it's it's just one of those things that constantly comes up in the conversation about um, supporting indigenous students and finding education thank you so should we label the OSAP cuts that were made? Should we, like I'm the critic for colleges and universities, so I guess I'm asking, should I be out there saying the cuts to OSAP are an act of systemic racism? You're perpetuating inequality. I mean. Um, absolutely, because I think at the end of the day, education is one, if not one of the only, frankly, one of the few tools we have left in this more unequal age. Um, that we have to kind of lift communities up and level the playing field and give everybody that door of opportunity to kind of escape their status of birth and to achieve um, their full potential. We don't have many levers of upward social mobility anymore and education is, is probably the biggest of the remaining ones. And when you cut off access to funding for education for low and even low mid middle, lower and middle income families, you cut off access to education. Um, and I think, and if you look at who the OSAP cuts are hurting, it's not hurting kids at Queens Commerce, which is a very affluent, pretty mostly white program. 
you're not hurting kids at Rockman, at UFT, you're not hurting kids at Ivy, at Western. You're hurting a lot of racialized, low-income youth um, studying a bunch of other programs, political science, sociology, social work, uh, communications, English degrees, people, um, friends who I know who were hoping to become aspiring teachers in the education system to kind of reverse a lot of the issues we're seeing today with educators that don't look like the students they serve. They've had to put their university educations on hold because of the OSAP cuts. And so at the end of the day, when when these reductions are impacting the equity seeking groups who, who student aid is most designed to support, it's clear that it is a racist act. Thank you. Let's see, let's go to the next question. So, um, so this is a big question and, and I wanna extend it a little bit more. What is the Black Lives Matters movement? And I would extend that to say, what is this moment and how do we describe, is there a, a definition for this, this movement that we're in right now or this moment that we're in? Lorme. Um, so the, the Black Lives Matter movements that have happened, that happened in, I think in 2017 is when we started to see and hear a lot about them here, um, are literally what it is, like what they are calling them, that Black lives matter, not matter more, not like they just matter which is the most hilarious thing I have ever said in my grown up professional career ever, right? So the movement is just trying to let people know that we also matter. In this moment, um, actually I would argue in 2017, the BLM movement um, was also in solidarity with uh, other indigenous movements um, and queer movements. But I, I don't, I think people were so scared about the idea of Black Lives Mattering that they didn't pay attention to the amount of solidarity work that was happening within that movement. Um, what we have just witnessed um, sort of starting in the beginning of June across the, the country um, and so many different locations in Ontario were Black Lives Matter solidarity movements where you saw all sorts of people come together but it was happening in the context of a pandemic. And I think it's really important for us to note that we put our lives on the line to show up at these solidarity movements because black indigenous and uh, other racialized people's lives matter that much. And so I think um, as, simp as simplistic as that explanation is of the movement, um, it's literally remembering that because our lives matter, access to education for us also matters. Access to affordable housing also matters. Access to um, healthcare that meets our needs also matters. And so people have, um, have actually held on to this movement at this moment in time uh, in a way that I've never actually seen before, um, which I think is quite fascinating and leaves me pretty darn hopeful that um, we are going to be able to, as a collective, um, do something differently and invest in our lives in a different way, because it's not just one group that's saying uh, that this has to happen for me. It's literally us saying, we don't like the way this, this world is. And so let's do it differently. Let's center different people and let's see if we can make it better. Um, so to pick up on one point Laura May said in particular, it, nobody's saying with Black Lives Matter that Black Lives matter more than any other lives. And I think that needs to be very specifically said. Like when I remember in high school, whenever I, I brought up these conversations on race and equity in class, oh, people, a couple people would say, oh, you hate white people. And it is not about that at all, but it is about making sure that community, that black communities that have often been disregarded, that have been left behind, that have been tokenized, that have been absolutely ignored, are finally heard as we make decisions on policy, as we allocate funding, as we do the things that actually move the needle, make meaningful change in our day-to-day -day lives. That's what this comes down to. It's um, like I saw this great anecdote um, on Twitter, like somebody was saying, so what do you say to like um, low-income, poor, rural white kids in rural, in rural uh, Kentucky, which I think have some of the, like, the lowest average income rates in the entire US. And somebody said, 
what's what Black Lives Matter and systemic racism means in that context is that nobody's saying that. Um, so it's two things. One, their uh, their race is not one of the things making their lives and their economic condition any more worse. And number two, nobody's inherently questioning their work ethic for being low income. If you see a low income black person, oftentimes people say they're not working hard enough. They need to lift up their bootstraps. They need to. Um, they, they need to take accountability and personal responsibility for themselves. But if you see low income groups about, uh, from other demographics, you don't see that sort of kind of rude self-questioning assumptions. Um, and so that's what Black Lives Matter eventually comes down to. It's not that your, your life is any particularly harder, but it's just that race hasn't been one of the things making it hard, which is absolutely true for Black folks. Every Black person I know, me included, knows we've been passed over, we've been overlooked, we've been condescended to, we've been belittled, frankly, because for demographic reasons. Um, and I think what this moment actually means is no more window dressing, fake equity, diversity, and inclusion stuff. I'm not looking for any more superficial ministers of diversity, inclusion, and youth. What I'm looking for is actual dollars, is actual change. I don't need a minister of education to go out and talk about recognized systemic racism, like congratulations, and actually put the money behind these streaming and put the resources behind to get it right. Don't just do it to make, it, to make yourself look busy to make it seem like you're actually changing something, but actually put the resources to make it happen well. Um, and so what this moment really means is actually putting our money where our mouth is, not just offering pretty sentiments, not just offering pretty committees, not just offering lovely strategies, putting the resources to actually tangibly change things. Because at the end of the day, resources and money is the only thing that will end up changing, changing things in our world. Thank you. I'm sort of keeping notes here. and. Uh... Oh, and I do want to come back to that, you know, putting our money where our mouth is, you know, I want to come back to that point, especially when we're looking at actions that are going to come out of this meeting. But Danielle, you, you go. Yeah, I just, I wanted to share a bit about um, my own observations in attending rallies and demonstrations and gatherings in a place like Winnipeg. Um, people might not be aware, but there were at least three people that were killed, uh, three Indigenous people that were killed over the course of 10 days in April. And that was, you know, since the lockdown, we've seen a number of Indigenous people that were killed at the hands of police. And one of the most beautiful things that I've witnessed uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement is that we've always been able to come together and stand in solidarity with one another. So following the Black Lives Matter rally here in Winnipeg, which garnered about 20 or 25,000 people in attendance, it was a magnificent uh, event to witness, which was probably the biggest in the history of Winnipeg since the strike of 1919. Um, we were a little bit worried about how many people would still show up for Indigenous lives. There was a young girl, she was only 16, and she was killed and shot by police. Uh, her name was Aisha Hudson, and we had a rally here in the city, and there were just as many people. I, I wouldn't say there was 20,000 people, but people showed up in the thousands, and I thought that was just such a, a beautiful rendition of, like I said, people standing in solidarity with one another. And I think it's so important to note that all of these movements have always been grassroots led. They're led by Black and Indigenous people, the people that are the most impacted and have no choice but to go and take up like the front lines. I um, mean, it's, it's really, really important to acknowledge how much work they've actually done um, in the time leading up to, you know, the death of George Floyd, um, that enough is enough. People are just getting so fed up and it's, it's just as important to ensure that we center those voices um, while we're continuing this work because the grassroots movement is what has kept this going and it's made the voice even stronger than it has before. Thank you. And you know what, this is actually a, a good segue into the next question we've received. And that is, so we, we've sort of developing a theme here. We've been talking about economics that you know, the disparity, the racism is, is built in on economics. And um, Amin was just talking about putting our money where our mouth is, that we don't just want lip service, you know, or, or nice gestures. You actually need to change the system. So the question that we've received is, what can we do as individuals? You know, not necessarily economically, but what can we do as individuals? So the people, for the people listening, and I want to thank the people who are listening, who are who've tuned into this. This is uh, just to, to take a little step aside. Uh, this is our anti-racism town hall. 
Uh, we have uh, MPP Laura May Lindo, Sean Conway of the uh, Curve Lake First Nation, Amin Ali, who's a student at the University of Toronto and a former uh, student trustee with the TDSB, and Danielle Morrison uh, from the Anishinaabek of the Nelngashing, yes, um, who's uh, recently uh, been called to the bar. So she's a, a brand new lawyer. So congratulations to Danielle on that. And I also want to give a shout out to Touring Inc, which is the company uh, that has organized the technology for this meeting. So the panelists, we are all part of a Zoom call. This is being live streamed on Facebook. And then it's also on the website that you and the audience are watching. And on that website, you'll see a text box. If you have a question, type your question into the text box. We're getting through as, as many as we can. And the current question is, what can we as individuals do in this moment? Uh, Danielle. Okay, I get asked this question all the time. And <laughs> I don't know whether to be hopeful about it or annoyed because at this point, I'm tired of being asked this question. I'll be really, really frank about it because the answers are out there. The answers have been out there for years. It takes a quick Google search to do some research about colonization of Canada. What is community calling for? What are community organizations calling for? You know, enough with the performative allyship and posting a black screen, do something concrete and center Indigenous and Black voices. It's as simple as that. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're getting, you're getting kudos from the people around. Uh, let's see, Amin and then Sean. Um, so a couple of tangible um, things. One is just to take up less space and listen to Black and Indigenous voices. Don't make your allyship about you. Don't project your guilt onto people. Don't ask for validation. Listen and hear their experiences. Two, once you listen and, and learn a little bit, educate and share your friends and family. Challenge their racist assumptions. Just don't bite your tongue or just kind of try and look the other way. Challenge it in the moment. Um, additionally, I think for those of you in the workplace, when you have Black and Indigenous colleagues, take the time to get to know them. Take time to make them feel welcome. Um, take time to include them. Avoid microaggressions. One thing I'm gonna say as a Black person always gets on my nerves, stop calling us articulate, please all the time, all the time you are so articulate. Like it is just, it's well intentioned, but it is such a microaggression because it, it shouldn't be that big of a shock. Um, or it shouldn't be a shock at all. Um, uh, additionally, I think if you're, if you're in a position of management, make the effort to, to seek out people from diverse communities. At the end of the day, hire the best candidate, but recognize the best candidate looks many different ways. And traditionally, uh, what people fit the best candidate to be is someone who's, who's a straight white male. And so make conscious effort to visualize other candidates for, uh, for jobs. And as a manager and as a colleague in the workplace, put them in line for promotions, put them in line for positions and not just tokenistic outward facing positions, but in positions of management, strategic positions of leadership and policy and research in particular. Um, and finally, the last thing I, I, I will say is that as, as an individual, realize that at the end of the day, trying to unlearn anti-racism in, in such an anti in such a racist system is going to take time you are you're going to make mistakes but if people call you up for it do not become defensive do not suddenly say i'm not going to do this anymore step back listen reflect realize what you did un unintentionally and then make an active effort to continue to correct yourself going forward and, and and take that as a challenge for the research thank you thank you so much sean yeah, and to to both of those points, um, uh, there's a there are a number of resources out already, and the 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 calls to action are are out there. Uh, whether it's from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, we're coming up on 25 years since uh, Dudley George was murdered. Um, there are recommendations in the Upper Wash Commission that have not been acted on. Um, there, it's been a year since the release of the report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada with recommendations that have not been acted on. Um, there, there is a to-do list. And for, for those that are in support of these uh, movements to support Black, Brown and Indigenous people in Ontario and Canada, um, use your time. Um, people 
who are experiencing oppression or oppressive systems and systemic racism in Ontario and Canada are, have a hard enough time than to advocate all the time. And uh, one of the most wonderful things that someone can do is to support those communities by making a call to their MPPs, to their MPs, to their mayors, to their councillors, uh, to their regional municipalities. And you look at all of these recommendations from these reports, this heart heartbreaking reporting that has come out over the last 25, 30 years, those recommendations are there and they're geared for educators, they're geared for municipalities, the province, the federal government, the police services, um, into every aspect. Pick one, send an email, make a phone call. That's one of the most powerful things you can do as an ally is to do that outreach uh, to your MPPs, to your MPs, your mayors, your councillors, whoever you think needs to hear that because there's work to be done and it's been spelled out what needs to be done. We, it is one of the shocking things that we keep getting these reports and then the actions just don't follow and the systemic change that we need doesn't follow. And so how do we push this this time? And, and I like what you were saying there, Sean. Uh, Laura May, I think you wanted to speak to this as well. Uh, thanks, Chris. I actually wanted to say what, what Sean was saying. Um, don't let us as elected officials off the hook. Um, pick a topic. All the recommendations are already there. Do not stand behind the call to have more consultations with racialized communities. Please don't ever request that. Force MPPs, <laughs> municipalities, MPs, Sorry. force us to do our work to actually implement the recommendations that, have, that already exist. Write to our offices and then keep writing us. Um, it's, it's easy as a click of an email. I sent you this message, I didn't get a response. I sent you a message, I didn't get a response. I sent you until we respond to you and then make sure that we do our work because technically um, the government is left off the hook if you send one email and then think that your allyship is finished. You have to show up consistently. I have to show up as a black woman in an anti-black world every single day, it is, it is exhausting. So join me in my exhaustion, write letters, right? Um, I am the critic for anti-racism in uh, Ontario. Send me your letters. I will accept them. My team is always mad when I say this in public spaces, but inundate my inboxes with calls to implement recommendations because technically I cannot actually sit back and allow that to happen. When I go to Queen's Park and I say overnight, I had over 100 emails from people. I had 200 emails from people asking for this to happen. The pressure is, remains on government. The minute you stop writing and you stop pushing me to do my job in that way, the government makes excuses to not do their work. And so I'm with Sean 110%. Um, put the pressure on us. That is our job. That's how you hold us accountable. And please, for the love of all things holy, don't ask for one more consultation. We don't need them. All the recommendations are there. Okay. I mean, one thing they said, Chris, that uh, caught my attention is just seeing how many reports are coming out. And one thing to build on, to look at, is look at the reports that came out 20, 30 years ago and see how little stuff has changed. One thing I'm gonna recommend in particular is the education. Look at the Stephen Lewis report in 1992. I was looking at it the other day. That, just the executive summary in the introduction, it looks like it, was, it could have been released last week. It is, the, and the recommendations are still spot on, the comments are still spot on. In the PDSB review, I was just looking over that today for work. And there was an excerpt that Stephen Lewis said that he heard a, a comment from a black student in, in Appeal High School how their teachers, their principals, their administrators did not reflect them. And verbatim, it literally could fit today in the context of what's happening at Peel. And so take time and educate yourself a little bit how little stuff has changed. And if you're interested in education, read up on the 1992 report by Stephen Lewis and just compare it to the coverage today because wow, 30 years and boy, have we wasted a lot of time. You know, I, I wanna just pose this question following up on the discussion we've just had. So we've had 30 years of reports. And, and more than that. And 
but we haven't created that kind of systemic change. What is the barrier to the systemic change that we need to see to create a more e e equitable society and more equitable opportunities? And how do we overcome those barriers? Laura May. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that from my actual vantage point as an MPP. And part of what I see as a barrier when I go to Queen's Park and I have to work with government um, is that they don't actually understand um, what racism looks like because far too little of us at Queen's Park have ever actually experienced it. So we see the subtleties, right? I remember being at Queen's Park and they started with um, the, using the language of illegal border crossers. That is racist language. That was not considered, um, uh, what do they say to us, Chris? They say that we have to speak respectfully in the house, but there's a word that they use that we get in trouble if we don't decorum. speak that way. What is it? It's not decorum, but they always say um, something to us. Because we're parliamentary, that's what it is. It is unparliamentary. So um, they said illegal border crossers over and over and over again for a period of time. And I remember one of our colleagues said, that's racist. And then was told that they had to withdraw their comment that, that named that other comment as racist because that was considered unparliamentary. So saying racist things is okay, but calling it racist is unparliamentary. That is a barrier to making the change because if everybody sits back and thinks that that is okay, um, then it is very difficult to have those same people uh, in charge to actually implement the change, which is why I think it's also really important to add to the last question that people have to vote differently. They have to actually take a chance to vote for what they want as, a, as opposed to voting for what they are afraid of. I think time and again, we voted against things as opposed to voting for something. So if we vote for a vision of change, of equity, um, of centering Black, Brown, and Indigenous voices, then you would see a different crop of people become elected to sit in those seats. You would, there would be a different kind of openness to implement these recommendations. That would be my hope. Um, and in the interim, because I don't have time to wait, just keep writing to people because sometimes they cave under public pressure. <laughs> Rant done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Danielle, and I'm going to turn off my screen for a minute. The battery on this computer is dying. I'm switching computers, but I am still here. So Danielle, you take it, please. Okay, so um, one of the huge barriers that I see to getting real work done is that education is lacking. We live in a country that denies a colonial uh, presence. It's not like we're in a post-colonial world. This is not a historical uh, trauma that we've lived. Uh, call it what it is. We, this country is built on a history of genocide and ongoing genocide and teach your children that because they're the ones that are going to dismantle the system, including us and all of the work that we're doing. It takes just as much work to educate ourselves and you have to put that same kind of effort into educating our children because it's going to take years before our education curriculums actually change to reflect the type of education that needs to happen in the classroom and make it mandatory. You know, I was having this conversation with a colleague of mine about educating on, you know, Indigenous history in Canada or making things, you know, as part of some content in some of our, our mandatory law classes, make um, that history class mandatory, make it examinable make it so that you're understanding how that history actually puts uh, white people at a place of privilege and that they continue to benefit from it and acknowledge that you continue to benefit from this privilege. I feel like this, it's just something that we avoid talking about because it's an uncomfortable conversation and we're worried about hurting feelings. And I really am tired of having to, you know, tippy toe over these issues in a classroom, in the courtroom, when it comes to getting my bar exams, just call it what it is. And also, why, why is it, un, why am I seen as an unbiased person when I share my experience with racism? It is not a wrong thing to call it racism. And I think we need to do away with that attitude towards Black, Indigenous, and POC 
sharing their experiences. It's already traumatic enough to have to be an Indigenous person or get called out on the street and worry about your life being on the line if you're walking downtown Winnipeg, um, let alone having to share that in a classroom or, you know, in training for getting my bar examination done to become a lawyer like I'm just tired of this so I really think that the education itself the education system itself needs to change to reflect that type of work that we're doing so that there's longevity to that work that we're not just working on ourselves that we're really dismantling the system so that it just ends once and for all like the calls have been there for decades. Uh, to follow up on that I think um, specifically I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that while I think in I think while the intentions and even the plans are there, the funding isn't there because we have a broken funding formula in Ontario. Um, just to give a bit of context, it was set up by the Harris government in the late 90s. And according to um, a report by Edfo in 2017, eight, in an $8 billion education budget, it took $1.5 billion out for my cares and tax cuts. You look at the per people funding in 2017, we ranked at fifth and 10th out of Canada, 18th out of 18th in the Great Lakes, and 45th out of all 61 jurisdictions in Canada and the US. We have a broken funding model that simply does not fund equity beyond a, a small, relatively microscopic learning opportunities grant. And that doesn't consider the realities of urban education, which is where a lot, not all, but a lot of these equity issues are centered. Um, and, and a funding model that prioritizes enrollment over any other metric. At the end of the day, enrollment tells you about how many heads you have in the system. But it doesn't tell you how many of those heads are racialized. It doesn't tell you about how many of those heads, the needs that they come with, the trauma they come with, the barriers they come into the system with. And so through an enrollment-based fu uh, funding framework, we inherently constrain ourselves as opposed to look at other metrics like need, which can be defined at, um, from a socioeconomic vantage point. Um, for, I think from a demographic vantage point, it's how many racialized students you have in, in your system. Certainly, um, from from example of student well-being, those other vantage points would allow for the funding to flow and would allow for the lens to be applied. Um, that that would there that would result in equity plans actually getting resources. But through underfunding and through a, a, a model that I think according to the FAO is eighty percent linked to enrollment, you simply don't see that focus on need, and we don't have the focus on need. You're never going to achieve resources for equity. So this goes back to a question that we were talking about earlier when we were talking about labeling actions performed by government as racist. So is what you're saying, I mean, that the fun, current education funding model in Ontario at the elementary and secondary level, is it racist? I think it definitely does perpetuate racism. Yes. Um, it's like the fact that you see, um, the, fact, the, the fact that you see so many black, um, such big discrepancies in black student achievement. If you want to get some great context on black student achievement, I'm going to encourage you to spend an, uh, a half an hour and read through a report by Dr. Carl James from, our, from York University. He put out a brilliant report in 2017 and moving towards race equity in education that really outlines a lot of the staggering, staggering achievement gaps that exist and the huge discrepancies in streaming and graduation rates and attendance of post-secondary. Under any other proper funding model that consider needs and consider outcome and consider equity and achievement, you would have seen uh, dollars automatically flow to support boards and initiatives to get more black students on a path to student success. But because we don't have that funding model, you don't see that. And, it's, and when you don't see that, you continue to see those disproportionately horrible outcomes for black students. And that in, of, in and of itself is racist. Laura May. Um, I was just going to add that oftentimes people get weirded out when you call things racist. Um, but if you take a step back and you think about the history of the things that we are now calling racist, you realize that they actually are. Um, like our education system was legally segregated. A lot of people don't realize that segregated schools was embedded in legislation in Ontario. Um, people don't pay attention to the underfunding of Indigenous schools. They don't pay attention to the fact that um, back when the EQAO was first, first implemented, uh, the idea was to try and figure out what was happening in different schools. And if you attach the EQAO results to the income and race and ethnicity of the people in those schools, you realized that the low the schools that were underfunded were highly racialized across the entire province that is racism that's what it looks like 
The fact that we allow it to continue is why we call it systemic, because the system, the education system, is perpetuating racial discrepancies. We can fix it. We can choose to adjust our funding model, which a lot of educators have been fighting for. We can choose to invest in schools to make sure that they have what they need. Um, or we can sit back and say, well, the racialized kids are just too rambunctious and that's why we've got a computer lab with 20 computers and only two work. Then you start using racist um, rationalizations to explain why you're not going to invest. That is, that in a nutshell, is racism in the education system. Okay, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting there. You know, I had this conversation with Zanina before she fell. So uh, just for people who are tuning in, this is our anti-racism town hall. We've got MPP, Laura May Lindo, Sean Conway of the Curve Lake First Nation, Danielle Morrison of the uh, Anishinaabek of the Nanagosh, and uh, Amin Ali, uh, current University of Toronto student, former student trustee. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Zanina Akande uh, was not able to join us. She had a fall, she's okay, uh, but she's um, not able to attend tonight. Even though she did say that she would try to zoom in from the hospital, uh, she's an activist in her 80s. And I think it really speaks to her spirit that she wanted to zoom in in spite of being in the hospital, possibly with a broken foot. Um, yeah, she's a, she's a firebrand and she's been, she's amazing. She's, um, anyways, I can't say enough good things about her. I want, want to go back to this question about the education funding, you know, as racism. And we, so this, when what the system that we have that Amin was talking about that, you know, we've been wrestling with is actually gives more money to schools in higher income areas and less money to lower income schools because the parents in the higher income areas can fundraise. And some of the schools fundraise $140,000 a year and even up to 200, I think the record was $200,000 in a year. And that goes into all this extra programming that the kids in the, in the wealthiest schools get. In the meantime, as a school trustee for, for eight years and as an activist for you know 10 before that, Every year, the only decision that was the trustees were left to make was what to cut, because every year there was another another funding shortfall. And so, when the government, like the TDSB last year, faced a sixty-seven million dollar funding shortfall, it was ten times that it was across the province. Every school board in Ontario faced a funding shortfall last year and had to make cuts. When that kind of thing comes up, should we be labeling that as racist? That those you know, those funding shortfalls. And how do, we, how do we change the narrative on that so that, you know, the government's actually confronted with the impact of what they're actually doing? It was a question. Anybody want to tackle that one? Laura May? I will tackle all the education questions. This time I'm going to tackle it, but I'm going to put a different hat on. I'm taking off my MPP hat and I'm putting on my doctorate in education hat. And having taught in teacher education for a number of years um, and looked at what the system is that we actually, how we prepare um, students to teach in the system. And from there, they become the principals, they become the directors, they, all of that stuff. The entire system is flawed because we're afraid to call things racist, like literally. And I think that part of why we're so scared to call these things racist is because we start to, we're not centering the racialized people who are impacted negatively by the system. We're centering the non-racialized people who are offended when we call something racist. I need us to center black, brown and indigenous people and be okay with calling things racist. Because the reality is for the black, brown and indigenous kids that are pushed out of school year after year, but told that they dropped out, that on its own is racist. They didn't drop out if from kindergarten, they were penalized more than other kids. They were pointed out more than other kids. They were, nobody did anything when they were called racist names at school. Nobody even called it racism. And then every February they celebrated black people, right? 
<laughs> or they would have a week where we all got to eat other people's food. I have, you know, I got to bring in my patties because my peeps are Jamaican. Awesome. But that doesn't solve racism, right? And so from a political side, what I learned in my research was that politicians are more inclined to do celebratory things. So we'll celebrate Black folks, we'll celebrate Indigenous folks. And in order for us to celebrate, we have to pretend that there hasn't been a genocide, that we're not on, there's no ongoing colonization that was all in the past, that Black folks are doing just fine so we can just celebrate them. We won't talk about um, the Chinese head tax and that history. We'll put up more statues of um, prime ministers all over the place to remind us of who is in charge. And then we are afraid to call things racist. So my, my anti-racism work as, a, as an education student for my master's and PhD allowed me a space to call things racist. Then I get to become an MPP and I get in trouble for labeling the same things that I saw as a researcher as racist, racist. So I'm going to buck the system and call all of the things racist until there is actually equitable outcomes for different racialized people. And I will do that until um, I see real change. And I think that other people should be okay with that. And they should join us in, in calling things what they are. Okay. Thank you, I mean. Um, to build on what Laura May said, I think in terms of shifting, how do we take a racist funding model and make it more equitable and anti-racist, I think a big part of it uh, comes down to supporting representation of black people in these positions of leadership. Like Laura May touched on teacher education programs. And the fact of the matter is that educators in this province don't reflect the students they serve. If you look at the PDSB review, I, I was shocked to see this, but 85% of, of students in that board are racialized. Only 25% of teachers are racialized. That is a huge gap, a huge gap. And that shows that we have, we have a lot of work to do in terms of making our teachers more reflective. But it doesn't even just stop there. When I was at the TDSB, it's not a perfect board, but I think it's better than a lot of other boards in this province. And I think a big reason um, for that and why they're moving forward, uh, that why they, they've been years ahead of moving towards de streaming, that programs like model schools, these learning opportunities index, uh, they have Afrocentric schools, why they have all of these initiatives, while they aren't enough, they're a heck of a lot better than we've seen in the rest of Ontario. The reason is that you have representation on senior staff. When I looked around the boardroom, I saw a staff that looked like that that that, that reflected uh, Toronto, that reflected all of us. When I first started, two of the of the uh, of two of the three two of the, uh, two out of three of the board's associate directors were black. Um, then in, uh, Indigenous peoples in all sorts of roles, then people of color in all sorts of roles, and at the end of the day, that's what happens when representation matters. You have you have a critical mass of people to have those critical conversations, and you also have um, people who can call out the um, things that I think are unconscious bias in meetings, in policies. Um, because at the end of the day, if you only walk in your shoes, you don't walk in anybody else's shoes. And so that's why it's so important to have as many lived experiences around the table, because if you don't have that, no matter how the policy is made, no matter how it's consulted, it is going to contain structural inequities. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna to go to the next question here. The, um, let's see. How should we improve, and this is a follow-up question, it's still on the education topic, how should we improve our education system in around grade 2 to 12, as well as post-secondary, to cur curtail racist bullying in our schools and to educate and to prevent racist teachers and racist school staff in the future? Um, no takers? I can go to the next question. Okay. Laura May, okay. I don't want us to go to the next question. I think that we should answer all the questions that come to us. So okay. I will say very, very quickly um, how we can tackle racist bullying. I think that there's, in order for us to actually fix the experience that happens to um, Black, Brown and Indigenous kids from two to post-secondary, you have to think about how their, how their teachers are being taught like, I actually think we have to not separate out teachers college and what that curriculum is from the curriculum in elementary, middle and high school. Um, when, when teachers are learning in teachers college, 
uh, about the school system. They're literally being taught the system. That is what teacher education is because they're going to enter into a new system, right? Just like I would argue, and Danielle, tell me if I'm wrong, for law school, part of what you have to learn is what the legal system looks like before you start to learn the nitty gritty of particular areas of law. Um, but one of the things that's interesting when you look at teacher ed is that the equity courses that, that are required in, a, in your teacher education uh, certificate come at the very end. You do two practicum in school with a host teacher, with a supervisor to practice all of the tools to be a good teacher, except for the equity tools. You get taught at the very end of that whole degree. Oh yeah, and there's some racialized kids, you might meet them. And then you get sent off into a school and then because that gets perpetuated, come grade two, three, four, middle school, high school, you don't have the tools to actually address the things that you are seeing. Sometimes you don't even have the language to know that what you're, you know it feels wrong, but you don't know what is happening because that's never been taught in the same way that all the other stuff is, is taught because it is valued. Um, and so I think that there's things that you can do in the way that the entire system is structured that will help to address those inequities. And I'm going to hand it over. Who's next? Sean. Yeah, I just had a couple more more points. You know, when when I was going through the school system, I didn't I didn't feel very supported whatsoever, and that's a fairly common, fairly uh, common experience. But I want to maybe focus on something that that does get into the spirit of what the question was and into a program that we're um, supporting here in the community is uh, some of our education staff are actually attached into um, the local um, uh, elementary and uh, secondary schools, part of like a student success program that's based for, um, for Indigenous students to access, you know, culturally sensitive individuals, people that are from this community that are working in the schools and, and helping connect uh, those students to resources and being there as, you know, someone in their corner when navigating that system. And I think it's a good system uh, that we have in place um, to, to support our kids who are, are going through there. And, you know, knowing that that sort of support is, is there is is nice for me, you know, as a as a new father, thinking in a few years when my kids are going to those schools that are not necessarily on the reserve schools, but when they start getting into those older uh, grades, that those sorts of supports are something that this community found as a priority, um, and for us to think about that sort of programming and support system for our kids. Uh, in in all schools, I think is really important. You know, we're seeing now in the last couple of years a lot more um, um, Indigenous folks being attached into post-secondary institutions, into public schools, and I think that's a good step. But we've got to make sure that that's that's equitable for for all people, um, and I think it's a good model to look at. Okay. Um Thank you so much. And so I just want to do a brief for anybody who's just tuned in. This is our anti-racism town hall. We're joined by MPP Laura May Lindo, uh, Councillor Sean Conway of the Curve Lake First Nation, Danielle Morrison from tuning in from uh, Winnipeg, from the Anishinaabek of the Nanagosh, and uh, Amin Ali, a former uh, student trustee with the TDSB and now a, a University of Toronto student. We have a question that's going to take this conversation in a, in a bit of a different direction. Um, and it has to do with the recent decision by the city of Toronto to uh, pay for body cams for police. When the TPS decides to roll out body cams, has there been any recent discussions on policies in order to prevent the action of a TPS officer uh, from turning off the device or from removing it during the situation uh, where there is an abuse or a potential abuse of an individual's rights? Or will the uh, TPS be able to just turn off the cameras as they as they see fit and i'm not sure if people have the expertise to respond to this question on the i'm not sure if we have a panelist who can answer this and for laura may i can't answer 
it entirely, but I can tell you what concerns have been raised when conversations around body camps have come up. Um, I don't know if that'll be helpful for the person, sure. but um, I know that in my community, uh, there have been, because there's been calls to defund the police at the same time that there have been the solutions proposed by police to get body cams, there have been real um, pushback from community that the calls for body cams are just another way of inflating police budgets. So people like community around me have raised serious concerns um, with that as a solution to, uh, they don't agree that that is a solution to uh, addressing racism in policing or violence in policing. Um, the other thing that I've heard from community is that there are real concerns around um, privacy and that the cams can actually become uh, another way to collect more data. So we've already been fighting against carding. Now we have these body cams where who knows what other information is getting attached to um, particular situations. And because again, community talks often about being over surveyed. So you'll have a lot of community members who have, um, who would be considered quote unquote known to police, not because they've done anything, um, but because they're known to police since they're watched all the time, um, that there are concerns that the body cam, uh, the information coming there will be uh, a lot more than people even realize. So that's, that's what I can contribute from community on my end about that. Okay, thank you, Dan uh, Danielle. Um, I just wanted to share on uh, a bit of perspective from a role that I carry out sometimes as a legal observer. And this conversation comes up a lot about whether you should be filming, say there's a police altercation with someone that's at a, at a protest, for example. And generally, we don't encourage that you film or take pictures because what can happen is that when someone draws on that evidence in, the, in court, it's very easily um, twisted and it can be used to further prosecute someone who is actually captured on camera. And so in terms of police accountability, I think that community led movements like legal observation, which encourage only taking a record of what the police are doing in that instance and not drawing the focus on someone who is being attacked by the police or who's being harmed by the police is a really effective way of police accountability. That's just one example that is very, very easy to do. And yes, 100%, there is a very strong call to defund the police. When we were at the Black Lives Matter movement um, at the beginning of June, the rally here in Winnipeg, there was such a strong call from the organizers to have no police presence. They were very, very clear and they were obsolete because we had uh, grassroots led movements like the Bear Clan Patrol and the the Mama Bear Clan Patrol. And these are built on things that have been around for decades. I grew up in a place like Kenora where the Friendship Center built um, the street patrol because there were so many people that were dying of exposure. And so they literally just took civilians and our own people to take safety into our own hands. Um, safety and accountability should 100% be community led. Okay. That's, no, that's really interesting actually. There was a uh a mall near my house where there was a problem with uh, youth raiding and stealing. And they brought in, and they brought in elders into the community, not, and not native, it was a, a different community. Um, but they just put a whole bunch of tables in the middle of the mall and in, invited the older people to come and play cards and everything settled down. People don't, young people tend not to misbehave. So it's interesting what you were saying about the, the mother clan. We have a question here from a social work student and she says, as a social work student, I know a lot about the history of my profession and other, and she quote unquote, helping professions in perpetuating racist systems and beliefs about and being complicit in genocide. With an ongoing discussion about shifting from enforcement-based community work, i.e. policing, to work that prioritizes community well-being, mental health and economic initiatives, how can we ensure that social initiatives don't fall into the same racist patterns uh, that they have in the past? It's a big question. Do you want me to, do I need, should I read it again? Yes, okay, I'll read it again. It is a big question, so it's, it's important. As a social work student, 
Whoops, hold on. As a social work student, I know a lot about the history of my profession and other quote unquote helping professions in perpetuating racist systems and beliefs and being complicit in genocide. With an ongoing discussion about shifting from enforcement based community work, i.e., policing, uh, to work that prioritizes community well being, mental health, and economic initiatives, how can we ensure that social initiatives don't fall into the same racist patterns that they have in the past? Sean. Well, I think uh, to the person that asked the question, what they're doing right now and participating in this and, and educating themselves and, and uh, wanting to be a part of that, that discussion in, in changing um, the way that historically a lot of the agencies have acted, I think is a great, again, first step. We're, uh, we're always talking about first steps and unfortunately that's where we are. Um, but, but really that's a great, a great place to be and, and thank you for tuning in and being a part of this discussion and, and acknowledging that, that history because mm -hmm when we do see this sort of broad transformation of society where we can stamp out systemic racism and we can decolonize the way that our country runs, we need people that are compassionate, that know history, that can interact with communities in a, a fulsome and holistic way and have a balanced approach to providing care and helping. Um, so I, I hope that, that that answers it. Okay, uh, Danielle and then Laura May. One of the key things that needs to happen when we're doing this work is to ask the question of whether there's someone else that has already been doing this work for a number of years and to make sure that you're supporting them in those efforts so that you're not overlapping or overstepping. I think it's very easy to feel uh, really encouraged and like, I'm gonna take action, I'm gonna do something and then start getting all the people involved in your circle. Meanwhile, there are indigenous led movements that are already been trying to do this work and who are giving the same answers, but they're not being listened to because they are indigenous. I remember being in law school uh, in my second year when the Gerald Stanley verdict came out and um, Kent Roach was a guest speaker at our school and he wrote a book on the trial. He filled up an entire classroom full of students and professors and it, although it was so great that he was doing this work and he was raising awareness, I just couldn't help but think, why weren't we listened to as students? Why we were not having these conversations in the classroom? We try to invite people to have these discussions outside of the classroom because nobody wanted to engage on it. And the same thing happens at the community organization level. There are tons of um, underfunded organizations that try to do this work and they're just not supported. And so if it means that you have to set your ego aside and support someone else in that work, then that is absolutely what you need to do. Ensure that you're not following into the same pattern that has just led to, I don't know, the supporting of this racist system. It, they're all racist, the education, the healthcare system, the, the our legal system, our justice system. I hope that when people are listening to everything that we're, sh that we're saying, that they look at it through the lens of what we're sharing and that apply it to every single system. These are not unique answers that would only apply to our schools. These are all the same type of approaches that you can use um, at law school, for example, everything that Laura May had shared about how do we train our educators, that 100% applies to the same thing. People that are in these positions of powers, judges, lawyers, doctors, nurses, look at how you're educating those people. Thank you. That's really powerful. Um, you know, Laura May, I want to throw, I want, I know you want to answer that question. I want to throw one more piece to it. Saul Mamakwa is our colleague from Northwestern Ontario, and he's uh, one of the first First Nations uh, representatives in the, in the legislature. And he constantly refers to Queens Park as the colonial government. And I've been thinking, you know, and when he first said that, I, I had to think and I walk in the main doors of Queen's Park and all of the pictures in the main corridor are white men in red coats and then when you go down the other corridors it's all the speakers of the house and they're all white men except for your uncle Laura May and so 
And, and then there's in one corner on the east wing, there's a section for women. And on the second floor, there's uh, two rooms called the meeting place, which celebrate indigenous heritage. And in my writing, or not too far from my writing in Lake Ontario, uh, there's, a, I know this bit of preamble, but uh, when they were putting in the, the uh, water treatment plant, they actually came across 11,000 year old footprints in the clay, the man, woman, and child. And so those were some of the first peoples of this land, you know, after the ice age. And so for 11,000 years, there's been, you know, people on this land. And so far as we can predict, you know, 50% of them were women and all but the last 400 years were indigenous people. And so how do you, how do you feel about, like you're talking about all these systems are being racist. Laura May, you're a member of provincial parliament now and you walk into the same building. What's your response when you walk into that building? Uh, my response when I walk into Queen's Park is that I'm walking into the belly of the colonizer, like literally. My very, very first thought, um, and in fact, I did my maiden speech, like your first official speech, um, uh, as a, an elected official, you get 20 minutes to talk about anything you want. Um, most people talk about like something awesome in their riding, and I talked about um, how uncomfortable it is to be a black person in the in that chamber um, when I look at where the speaker is sitting above his head is written 1867 because that's the year that this became the place that we're in and I wasn't a person yet and every single time I look at the speaker which is where we always have to direct our comments you always have to look right there I am reminded that I am an anomaly to be in this place. Um, so that is how I actually feel. Um, I walk past the hall of speakers and it's true. My uncle is Alvin Curling. So he was the, ver the first black elected speaker of the house. I used to say he's the first black speaker of the house because that's what I thought it was. And one day he said to me, actually, when my name was put forward, they used to appoint speakers. But when my name was put forward, they decided it was time to elect speakers and I happened to still get elected. So it's important to recognize that that is what happened. So there's him and across, I, I cannot remember the speaker's name prior to the current speaker that we have, but I believe he is, um, I want to say he's Métis. Dave LeBac? Sorry? Dave, uh, Dave LeBac? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, that's it. And they're at the end of this big long hall. There's, there are little plaques that represent uh, different things at Queens Park and I've found a couple of them. Um, but to be honest, it is uh, a very scary experience to be a person of color in that space. And every day you are reminded of um, what you are now a part of. And so if we don't push back and if we don't, if we are told it's unparliamentary to call systems that have oppressed us, oppressive systems and racist systems, then we're literally perpetuating the same harm on our own people. That is a horrible thing to feel. Um, but I did wanna take that and go back to the question as well, um, because part of what I have to do at Queen's Park is what the person who asked the question can also be doing in their profession. I have to decolonize Queen's Park. My body being there already starts that decolonization process. The call to have a black caucus in the NDP started that decol like continued that decolonizing process. Um, having Saul speak in Queen's Park and talk about the realities of his community um, and, uh, and say words that people didn't think would ever be said in that space because in 1867, we weren't people. Um, decolonizes that space because now it becomes part of the cockles of history for the province. Um, I think for the person who's thinking about those social services, that is a valid concern. And in fact, in our um, end police violence document, and we're talking about investing in community, one of the things that we also say is that we have to make sure that culturally responsive training becomes a mandatory part of all of these systems because every one of them has been built to not see us as human. Um, it's not just policing, it's the criminal justice system and it's not just that, but it's the healthcare system and the education system and the, all the systems. And so um, 
looking at things like uh, One Vision, One Voice, which was a document that was recently published and they were doing work in child welfare. That is a horrid system if you think about the colonial roots of our welfare system. But work has been done to decolonize that, that system and turn it into a system of care. Like it's not, we're not arguing that certain kids don't ever have any problems and that certain communities don't need help. We're just arguing that um, we should not be uh, harmed when we call for help. And I think that that's one of the hardest things for people that don't experience what we experience. Uh, it's the hardest thing for them to swallow, but it's it's a reality. You know, I just we're we're going to be summing up shortly, and and I want to give everybody an opportunity to just sort of summarize where we're at, um, and also to think about the action items because we want to come out of here. One of the first questions was, what do we do as individuals? So when you're thinking about your 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 final thoughts, if you could. Um, think about what actions we should do as individuals, what actions we should do as, as groups. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to say, uh, I want to thank you for, for being here. It's, uh, it's an incredible privilege for me as a gray-haired white guy to be part of this discussion and to hear your experiences and to, to come to at least some understanding of your experiences and where we need to go to create you know, a better province, a better country. Um, and so thank you all for, for being here. And th that's not the final though. Um, we are gonna go around and if uh, each of you could just take a few minutes to sort of summarize what you've heard in this conversation and what people in the audience can take away from it, what actions uh, they should be looking at in, in uh, thinking about this meeting. So who would like to go first? Sean. Yeah, and again, um, uh, thanks you, thanks to you, Chris, and and your team uh, for for putting this together. I think I think this is a great a great thing for um, for us to be a part of, but also for for the audience. And uh, I'll, I'll just go back to something that that I said earlier was the recommendations that all of these different reports have um, been put out for for decades now that that's the to-do list and that advocacy, you know, we know that you as an audience member support these ideas and the way to take that and turn it into action is to, again, what Laura May was talking about is make the phone calls to your MPP, to your MP, to your mayors, your councillors, your regional government, to, um, to anyone that'll listen. And because these calls are there, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report um, the Ipperwash Commission, uh, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Women and Girls Report. There, there are so many things that need to be done and it starts there. And then on a, another note, we're all spending a lot more time at home these days. One of the things that we can do to support Black, Brown, Indigenous, people of color um, is to consume media produced by Black, brown, indigenous, people of color. It's one of the most helpful things that we can do is to, um, you know, nobody buys CDs anymore, but you can you can download some music, pay for it, buy, buy books, um, you know, interact with, with, with so much great art that's, that's out there. Um, there are so many artists right now that are, that are really feeling a pinch from not being able to perform, to be on the road or, or do what have you, um, start consuming media that is diverse. I think, you know, it's one of the most rewarding things you can do um, alongside calling your MPs, MPPs, mayors and councillors. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Sean. Uh, who would like to go next? Danielle? I was just like hurriedly taking some notes. Um, what can you do as an individual? You can educate yourself um, and allow yourself to be corrected. Know that this is not about you nor your ego when you're doing this work. Don't do this type of work for the clout or to add it on your CV 
as having gained some experience in anti-racism work. This is about BIPOC people. Um, educate and correct others in your circle. Know that the work that is like some of the true work that happens is being able to be the only person in the room that calls out uh, your friends or your colleagues or people that are in those positions of authority um, to correct them. And then educate your children and our young people and then let them take the lead. Young people are such a gift and I have so much hope for our future when I see young people taking over TikTok and speaking out about racism. Um, not that I encourage TikTok because I've heard some really crazy things about it lately. Um, <laughs> but let the young people take the reins. They have so much potential um, as the voices of our future and take the privilege that you have um, as a person in a position of power and privilege and use that to amplify the voices of other people who have been silenced forever and are continuing to be silenced. Um, and more specifically, I think from an Indigenous perspective, I really see so much work happening on the community level to revitalize our own ways of doing things. And I really, I, I wanna put a, a strong call to this entire country that is listening, that we have always been a sovereign nation, that it has always been about nation to nation relationship building and that our laws have existed uh, since time immemorial. And that, you know, it's not about just implementing um, certain cultural aspects or legal traditions into the current systems that we have. It's about dismantling those systems altogether because they're built to oppress us. Oh, I could really go on about this for hours. <laughs> but I think I'm going to leave it with those few th final thoughts. And I just want to say uh, to Chris uh, and your whole team, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm, I'm just so hopeful when I get to share the space and, and have these conversations with people like, like Sean and Laura May and Amon. Thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Laura May, would you like to go next? Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'm reading this new book called How to Be an Anti-Racist by um, Ibram Kendi. Uh, and apparently there's a workbook that goes with it. I love it. I, I have not finished it, but I love it because he, is un he speaks about his own journey as a Black man in the States, uh, becoming anti-racist and actively always having to be anti-racist. It's literally a state of mind, which leads me to the next thing that I want everyone to do. I want everyone to go to their respective places and go find Redemption Song by Bob Marley and just play this one part. I just want you to play over and over again. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Because it's not up to me to free your mind. If you want to be anti-racist, then you have to emancipate yourselves. You have to think differently about the world you live in. You have to be okay with that. Like emancipation is, is a good thing. Um, and you have to free yourself from the way that, the, that society has taught you to think about things. Because for racialized folks, if you center us, our experiences are vastly different. So I think if you read that book and then you sing that song, everything will be awesome. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. You know what? I think seeing that was really powerful because it's a mnemonic device and it's in my head now. And I will be thinking about that for the next day or two. So thank you for singing. Okay, Amin. Um, so thanks, Chris, for taking time to, do, to organize this important conversation. Um, for me, the big thing going forward is let's make this moment pass go past the new cycle. At the end of the day, systemic racism is not gonna end the minute that the TV cameras go off and the media cycle moves on to the next big thing. Black trans women are not, uh, are not gonna sit suddenly and stop dying because um, the coverage has happened. This is gonna be a decades long, lifelong fight against systemic racism. It took 400 years to set up the system and it's gonna take decades and decades to undo it. Um, and I think it's really important for us to not just confine ourselves in that space. Um, and so a big thing that people can do is, is, is in their own lives. Just as a starting point, watch how you engage the Black, Indigenous, and people of color in your own lives, professionally, personally, 
uh, and just be conscious of things like microaggressions in particular because at the end of the day for like um, for me what I see is it's not what really gets most black people it's not these big acts of police brutality that you suddenly see on camera but it's the day-to-day -day microaggressions that wear you down and make you feel like you don't fit in anywhere um, and I guess beyond that what we can do going forward is let's find ways to turn this, these intentions into something tangible. I just, I find, I'm, I've been saying this, this refrain a lot nowadays, but at the end of the day, the road to systemic change is not paved with good intentions. Intentions are important, but it will not get us where we want to go. We need to take it in one step further and actually translate it into action. And so, um, and so commit to yourself to do some tangible things. Like if you're in Toronto, make a donation to the Black Legal Action Center, which does incredible work um, in supporting Black communities. Um, and take time and read the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Learn about the history of I Don't Know More and maybe understand why Sean got so engaged in Indigenous a a activism because of it. Um, at the end of the day, we're not gonna get to where we wanna get to it in an ideal society simply by thoughts and lovely words alone. It's gonna take real action. And so that takes a real commitment from all of us. Wow. You know, thank you so much. And you know, I, I wanna thank all of you on the panel for being here. I know it must be tiring at times to have to educate people all the time about your own experiences, but I appreciate the energy that you're putting into and that you, you gave us tonight, uh, the, the two hours that you spent here with sharing your experiences, sharing your thoughts, helping to educate us because we all ra were raised in a racist society, you know, and we're all trying to understand that better and these kind of conversations really do help us. And hopefully, you know, now we can, we have some actions, uh, you know, specific actions and also, you know, just consciousness raising actions as well. Uh, so thank you all to the panelists. Thank you so, so much for your time, for your energy, uh, for sharing your experiences with us. And before we go, I also want to acknowledge uh, Yash and Richa from Touring Inc who managed the technology here tonight. Uh, which is, it is just a, a, an amazing thing, this technology. I, I don't know how it's quite working. And I also want to thank uh, Pranav and Nancy and Benna from my office who have been working behind the scenes, who made sure that all of the panelists got here, that the audience got here and every, everybody else. So thank you everybody for making this happen. And thank you so much to the audience. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you for your interest in this issue. And this is, this is not the end. This is just another step along a long journey. So thank you very much for being here.